Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kevin Gregory from Health Action Council. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. Um, we've got some folks as they're getting to come in. Uh, I want to thank everybody as before we get started. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of the Health Action Council premium annual supporters, uh, as you'll see on the screen. Uh, I also want to thank um, Phil Kaufman, um, who is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for Union Healthcare, the employer and individual. He is accountable for aligning and leading the operations, product marketing, consumer and business advancement functions in support of and in close collaboration with the employers and individual businesses. Along with Phil, we've got Sonia Lively. Uh, thank you for joining us, Sonia. She is the Director of General Management for United Healthcare. Sonia currently leads United Healthcare's readiness strategy for transparency programs, which focuses on end-to-end -end readiness from an enterprise and customer point of view. Finally, and last but not least, is Christina Johnson. Thank you for joining us, a program director at United Healthcare. She leads large scale enterprise regulatory programs. She's an active customer advocate focused on solving business problems in the payer and provider business as a technician, developer, project manager, and program coordinator. Uh, for the benefits teams, uh, the Consolidation Appropriations Act has proven to be very impactful, uh, disruptive piece of legislation since the ACA. It's interesting how the, the three letters are same, but they just mix them up a little bit there. So they're teasing us there. Uh, in the session, we will look at some key legislative and regulatory updates from the CAA with an emphasis on transparency. We'll also learn how UHC's readiness implementation team is preparing for the upcoming changes to help address what's on the minds of plan sponsors today. Um, before we begin, I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat box uh, located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat box and we'll pause at the end of the presentation to respond to questions. Uh, if for some reason the chat box is not working or if you run into any technical issues, please feel free to email me at kgregory it's K-G-R-E-G-O-R-Y at healthactioncouncil.org. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees. We will also be happy to provide you with a copy of today's slides. With that, I will turn it over to Phil and, and look forward to a wonderful presentation. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. And you can go to the next slide here. We really appreciate the time today. I wanna to again thank the Health Action Council for having us here. For um, those of you who either work with them or are thinking about um, joining them, I can just tell you they're tremendously partnership oriented as well as proactive and very forward thinking in terms of how they approach healthcare within the space. Um, you did a nice introduction earlier of our speakers, so I won't uh, spend any more time on that. But if you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about consumers' healthcare affordability concerns. And this is where this starts. I mean, there's so much pressure from individuals and saying, hey, my health care is too expensive, small employers saying my health care is too expensive. And that has really manifested itself over the last, you know, certainly the last five or 10 years, but the last year in particular, it's manifested itself in legislation. And I think one of the changes here, or certainly a very significant difference from my previous 20 years in healthcare, is that the legislation now is reaching much more deeply into self-funded ERISA-based plans. Historically, a lot of that regulation really stayed within the fully insured space, but now it is expanding significantly. And that's really the dynamic of a lot of what's driving you know, a lot of these different bills and acts. So if you go to the next slide, um, there's a lot on our minds. There are a lot of buzzwords, transparency, mental health parity, no surprise billing, gag clauses, plan compensation tools. I could go on and on. What we're going to try to do today is we've got an hour. What we're going to try to do is strike the right balance between strategic and giving you our view of high level, what we think is going on and what we think, frankly, you need to be thinking about. And then we will also do between Christina and Sonia some, we'll try to get a little bit tactical so you really understand what's in there and what could be the implications for my firm. So we'll we'll try to strike that that balance today. If you go to the next slide. Um, um, Christina will go in detail on the Consolidated Appropriations Acts. And I would say that there are a number of, again, I won't, I'm not going to read all the points here. There's a number of administrative items in there, ID cards, gag providers, continuation of care, et cetera. 
But the biggest piece of this is is really the um, out of network provisions. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we'll talk about a couple other key elements of this, but the out of network provisions is a really big deal. And restructuring and putting in place more guidelines to hold the member harmless and how the insurance company and the providers are going to negotiate these out of network um, these out of network bills. And and I'm not again, I, I'll I'll let I'll let Christina cover kind of some of the details behind this. But what I, I'm going to speak to is strategically, how do we see this changing the field? And I think the first thing that we're thinking about is on balance, is this going to make out of network providers more likely or less to participate in network? And will it make their behavior more or less egregious from what we see today? Those are kind of the key elements that we are focused on. And I think heading into this, um, and there's a lot of detail yet to be determined, I would say um, generally that A, there's gonna be a lot of state level variation. So any answer that I give you here could differ a little bit in the way in which, because some states have their own out of network rules, and um, consumer protections in place. So how that interacts with the national bill has yet to be fully defined. So I'm gonna put that aside. Keep in mind that there will be a decent amount of state variation here, but on balance, the way in which this works, I do believe that over time, it will drive more rational behavior in the out of network space. And um, there's a lot of ins and outs of how that'll work and baseball style arbitration and all these different things. But I, I think at the end of it, um, I do think that it drives um, that type of um, behavior. The, the second thing I will tell you here is that um, while th there's a surprising lack of clarity on all of this today, and we're still waiting for additional guidance to come out from the federal government, I, I do believe that there's a decent chance some or all of these provisions do get pushed back. Now that doesn't, we're in full preparation mode right now as you should be. I don't think we can count on that, but I, as I look at it and given how many wide spaces there are for interpretation here, I, I think there's um, there's certainly more to come in terms of, in terms of definition. Um, so we'll get into more details in a second. If you go to the next slide, I do want to call out one other element of this, which is buried within here, there is an additional focus on mental health parity. Now, nothing is new. There's no actual new regulations around parity itself. That's been here for a while. But what is new is that there are more reporting requirements, and particularly for self-funded plans, now there's a clause that says, hey, you know what, a government can approach you and say, hey, I want you to produce this documentation. What I would tell you is, is that first of all, this is not designed with ERISA-based plans in mind. This absolutely was designed for health insurers, for to give the, the federal government and the states more tools to go to health insurers to prove that they are in compliance. Now that doesn't mean that if you're a self-funded um, client, you 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 can ignore it and just say, "Hey, I'm not I'm not going to pay attention to it." Um, and our teams kind of stand ready to kind of help you through that process and what you need to do. But I also just want to kind of give you the practical view that we would be very very surprised if um, tomorrow all of a sudden you're going to see you know states and everything requesting. Wh where the risk is more, frankly, is from class action um, lawsuits and trial lawyers getting into this information and understanding, hey, wait a second, you may have violated ERISA as an employer. So that's really, when you think about the risk of this, I, I just want to kind of call that out. That's where we really see the risk is. It's it's on our shoulders, it's on yours to make sure that everything is really tied up from a compliance standpoint. And again, the risk isn't in the reporting, right? The risk is that you would actually have something in your plan that isn't compliance. Um, and then that, you know, maybe there might be some type of class action um, behind that. Let me keep going here because, um, and just we, we discussed this beforehand from a pacing standpoint, we're gonna try to move relatively quickly to make sure we can we can get to your questions at the end. I think you said earlier, you can just enter questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to pick up as many of those as we possibly can. So if you go to the next slide, um, the, 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 so there's the, there's the Consolidated Appropriations Act within that is, is um, more mental health parity transfer, uh, re reporting requirements, but there's also a separate, a completely, the tri, completely separate bill, the tri -A agency, transparency, rule, and coverage. This has two parts. The first part is a consumer transparency tool. That starts a little bit later. So that's 500 specific shoppable services on January 1st, 2023, and then all services on January 1st, 2024. I, I would tell you on this particular one, 
certainly if with United Healthcare, if some of you with different carriers, your your carrier is probably pretty close to complying with this today. Most have really good cost calculators. There's actually quite a bit of cost transparency um, if the member chooses to access it and kind of go in. It 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 probably stretches it a little further. Maybe there's more. There, there, I shouldn't maybe there is a few more things about out of network and could could I get an out of network estimate before I went, et cetera. But but for the most part, I, I think that um, everyone will be very ready to comply. Um, on January 1st, 2023 and 2024 with the consumer price transparency tools. The, the much bigger, more impactful part of this is this machine readable files. And, and what this means is that starting January 1st, 2022, United will need to disclose its rates with every single provider for every single network that we have. And not just United, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, everybody. So all of the rates will be, in theory, 100% visible in the open market. Now there's a compliance aspect because we need to comply as a fully insured player. And then for all of you, you will need to comply as well with this. So technically the compliance here is with the self-funded customer to show you know, what network you're, they're using and what rates. Now, Sonia will get in a later, just know that we'll be working to comply on your behalf. So you don't need to, you know, we'll work with you on that piece. Um, but I, I wanna talk to here the implications for the space, because I think that's the more, th this is the strategy part and how does this actually change the dynamics? I first wanna start with the COVID backdrop. Um, and I wanna start with just a reminder of the way in which a lot, I'm not saying every market, but in a lot of markets, the way negotiation works today is, is that providers are very limited. They can't really change their Medicare rates. They also cannot really change their Medicaid rates. So to the extent that they have pressure in their costs, in their expenses, the only practical place they can pass those costs in the near term is into the commercial market. Over the last year, because of all of the subsidies, PPP, direct subsidies to providers, it's a little bit difficult to understand what the financial condition is of the various systems around the country. So as that water comes out, um, it'll be interesting to see, okay, that, that could in theory put pressure on rate negotiations. Inflation, to the extent they have to pay their employees more, is going to put pressure on rate negotiations, and that is going to come into the commercial market. So that, that's an important backdrop of this, and this idea that really all, all the excess is going to get pushed into the commercial market. Um, now imagine everybody's rates are visible, and how does that change these negotiations? And I wrote down five things here. Um, I didn't put them on the page, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be pretty crisp on how I think this really changes the dynamics. Um, number one is that if, if all the rates are visible, I do expect that in any given market, the range that you would see is going to narrow a lot. Won't, won't happen day one. It'll take two or three years. But over two or three years, you'll really see the range of which providers are offering something in the market that will narrow. Number two, in markets where very large systems today have significant market power, you, I think, will see them basically raise the rates. Um, and I think they will take all those who were kind of lower before, and I think they'll raise them up. So I, I'm generally, I mean, there's different views on this, but I think generally the transparency in markets where providers have significant market power will generally lead to higher rates. Um, in a lot of situations, not in all, um, but in, in many situations. Now, on the flip side of that, on the positive note, number three, I do think the transparency will put a lot of pressure on egregious billers because before it, it would be very opaque. It's kind of hard to get at that. Now with everything out there, it will be very clear for all to see that, hey, wait a second, how come you're charging a thousand for that service in this contract and everybody else is charging 100. So I think that will be a positive on the other side. So there's some there's some puts and takes in terms of how the transparency will work. Um, number four, um, I think that you will see a lot more in terms of total cost of care. So as, as you see the, the narrowing and you say, okay, what's important now with my relationship with the system, my ability to share data with them, 
via pre-check my script or our point of care assist. And so you can see what data we're having. The um, the partnership we have, um, how we handle UMUR, how we think about a variety of different things, like those actually become increasingly more important in a space where there's a lot of transparency and the rate bands narrow and you see most of the health insurance providers operate in that rate band. Number five is, I would tell you, reference-based pricing. And th this comes up quite a bit. And I, I get asked, hey, you know, Phil, do you think that there's going to be a lot more reference-based plans? I mean, you know, we're just going to get rid of networks altogether. I am, um, there's different views here, but I'm, I'm a kind of firm believer that actually, as I said before, I think that the network contract becomes more important because it's not just about the rate. It's about the other things that you are contractually doing with that system. What information they're obligated, obligated to provide to you and vice versa. How are you going to work together? So I, I think those elements become more important. I also think that um, from a from a reference based standpoint, um, to my previous comments, I don't think you're just be able to say, hey, I'm just going to reference base my plan at Medicaid plus 15 percent. I think as soon as that gets any traction, the systems will say, hey, wait a second. No, no. You need to have a contract with us. Otherwise, we're just not going to see your, you're not going to see members who who typically don't have a contract with us. Um, uh, however, within the reference based realm, I do think that you will see more reference-based approaches in very specific verticals. And what I mean by that is, um, and I'll just call it a couple, this isn't definitive, but for example, um, radiology or anesthesiology. And you're saying, hey, you know what? For those specific sets of services, I'm either gonna do a bundle or I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you kind of the reference price for the entire market. So I, I do think this reference dynamic of having the transparency is gonna matter. Um, I think it's gonna matter in places where there's higher cost and lots of variation. Um, but to sum up, I don't see a lot of, hey, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna reference base all my pricing and that's that's the way I'm gonna operate. So that's that's just my view of the future. It's one individual's, but I'm here today to kind of give you some insight of how I think it's it's gonna play out. And then finally, I didn't mention it, but I, just to add on the last point, I do think you're gonna see more capitated and bundled arrangements. You see that a lot on the Medicare side today, I'd be shocked if that doesn't come more into the commercial space. That's the, that's the high level part. So oh, now, now, now we're ready to kind of dig down and I'm gonna ask my colleague, Sonia Lively to come on and um, we'll skip a couple slides ahead. I'll close out with commitment at the end, but um, Sonia, I'm gonna ask you to pick up on, on transparency coverage and we'll go a little bit deeper here. Oh, Sonia, we can't hear you. Sonia, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yes. Sorry about yes. that. Okay. Um, so as Phil mentioned, there are uh, two components of the transparency and coverage uh, rule that I'd like to speak to. And I, I want to also ensure that um, we, we talk a little bit about not only do we share the, at United Healthcare share the same goal to ensure that we have transparency, we're meeting the regulatory requirements on the stated timelines. I do want to note that we are uh, pursuing some advocacy efforts, excuse me, efforts related to these regulations in, uh, to tie the, com the Consolidated Appropriations Act provision uh, around the consumer price transparency tool and the trans uh, transparency and coverage rule to an implementation date of 1-1-23. And I'm going to apologize if I hesitate. I've got some uh, reverberation in my ear, so I'm not exactly sure how to solve for that, but I'm going to push through. Alrighty, so let's take a few minutes to look at the specifics and our plan forward toward compliance with the transparency and coverage rule. Next slide, please. Uh, first, as Phil mentioned, there are, uh, a requirement that we provide three machine readable files that are publicly available. The first file is the in-network file that uh, identifies by plan, by code, by contracted rate, and the providers with whom we have those contracted rates on a monthly basis. 
Um, additionally, the, the same is required for any out of network um, uh, allowable amounts. And then uh, as uh, uh, Phil mentioned, there's the prescription drug component as well. For, 2019, for 23, we have 500 shoppable services that will be required on the transparency tool. And then in 24, all services. The Consolidated Appropriations Act effort under this uh, regard is also being included in the transparency and coverage rule team, so we'll be covering both. Next slide, please. Within United Healthcare, we have a dedicated program team with representation from our legal uh, team, regulatory and compliance, technology, of course. We also have an identified end-to-end -end quality team and an end-to-end -end testing team. We're working closely with our commercial account teams to make sure that we understand any customer needs that uh, may exist. For example, a custom network that, a, uh, that one of the, our customers may have. Our actions to date have been ensuring that we've got a consistent understanding of the machine-readable file components, and that is across United Health Group not just from a United Health Care perspective, but also from an opt-in perspective. We've identified the data sources uh, across our applications that need uh, to be, uh, I'll say, accessed so that we can create the file. And we've also performed high-level customer plan analysis to make sure that we have a good understanding of what the customer-specific needs are, and we are addressing them. On to the next slide, please. Just a little more detail specific to the machine readable file requirements. I'd like to specifically call out that these files must be at the plan level, include all codes, and for each code, the contracted rate, the list of providers um, that we have for that rate. So you can imagine this is a tremendous amount of data that we will be making available. And we are looking at the uh, ways to make that data available that will be the most useful. On to the next slide, please. Um, we will, as I mentioned, create and publish the files required for medical and pharmacy for all customers uh, on the uh, on a United Healthcare site. Um, we will also provide support for custom requests, such as creating a monthly file and making it available to our self-funded customers to publish on, on an alternate site that they may choose. Based on the type of a custom request, there may be a fee. And we will not be able to support the creation of acceptance of raw data for file creation or publication on January of 22. Okay, the next slide, please. The regulations that a customer, excuse me, a consumer price transparency tool will be available to estimate cost share responsibility for, for various services at the member level is that January 23 and 24 requirement. We believe that our existing cost estimator tool is compliant and meets the provision requirements in the Consolidated Appropriations Act for January of 22. For January of 23, the tool must contain cost share information, including deductible amounts, out-of-pocket amounts, and provider-specific information, whether it's a contracted rate or an allowable amount, for any, as well as any medical management requirements for those 500 services. Consumers have more of a vested interest in understanding the cost of care and have more options, making it more important for consumers to understand the cost and services. And our goal is to support that effort. Alrighty, on to slide 16. I do want to call out just for a moment the various tools that we have available um, to our constituents. The myuhc.com uh, uh, system, which Amy Jordan will show you a demonstration of in just a moment, provides members with cost estimate information for over 800 services currently, including 600 episodes of care. We, that is what we will be expanding on 
to meet the regulatory requirements for January of 23 and 24. The Rally Connect is a tool that provides the ability to compare treatment options for various services and locations of services. And the Point of Care Assist uh, tool integrates health records and EMR real-time for providers to assess health, health needs and coverage information. We will make sure that these tools are aligned for consistent uh, views from both of our consumer constituents and our provider constituents as we move into those transparency tool needs for 23 and 24. And then for prescription services, the MyScript Finder gives consumers drug cost information for any out-of-network pharmacy. Now, let's take a look at a demo and how this works for someone. Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Sonia. Let me share my screen. Um, let's So Amy, Amy, I've just prompted got... you. You should be able to share it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let me know if you can see my tool. Yes, we can. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm Amy Jordan. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy for ENI. And so I just wanted to quickly walk through our current experience for our cost transparency tool within um, the MyUHD.com experience. We also have a companion app with the UHC mobile app that has cost transparency integrated within that as well. Um, but within this experience, we have um, cost transparency integrated with both our medical and our behavioral health directories. And so I'm just gonna quickly walk you through a few of the different ways that we help explain the costs um, and provide um, that additional information for our members to help them make better decisions. So members can search in two different ways. They can search through a text field to find a specific um, physician or a specific procedure or service, or they can go through down our, our guided search path. So I'm just gonna quickly take you through our guided search results. They're um, given a series of prompts, and ultimately they would land on a search results page, which lists out the providers um, available to them based off of what they chose. So a few different ways that we showcase costs within the experience. The first is at the top, this total average cost in your area. So this is pulling the claims information that we have in our system and aggregating that and looking at the average cost for a specific type of visit based off of the zip code that's set up for that um, individual member when they um, are onboarded through the experience. And so ultimately, this is kind of the expected range of the average cost for this type of office visit. If you scroll down here a little bit further, one of the things that we've actually recently implemented um, within the experience is bringing forward more specific costs um, for those individual providers so that members can more easily compare between provider. Now this is dummy data because this is a demo site, so the numbers aren't necessarily aligning here just in case that caught your eye. Um, but in this instance, this cost is reflected of the specific negotiated rate that we have with this provider um, based off of this type of office visit or specific um, a type of visit that you have selected here. And what's unique about this or what's interesting about this is this is actually dependent upon the plan design and where you're at within that plan, this cost would be reflective. So right now, if um, you haven't met a deductible, this would showcase the full cost. But if you have a deductible and you've met that and you're now paying coinsurance, this would actually be updated to reflect that coinsurance rate. And this is updated within our system in near real time as those claims get processed and that information comes forward. But that is the reason why it says you may owe because as claims get processed in the system, that number obviously could potentially change if you meet your deductible um, or things come back and are processed differently and those costs change. So that's one of the things um, that we call out here. Now, if you're wanting to get a little bit different um, additional information, you can actually click view services and costs and you actually get the full um, list of negotiated prices for all of the different services and procedures that we have on record with that provider. And then you get a similar breakdown in costs here. So the average cost based off of the zip code from that claims data, this is that aggregated right here. And then what we actually have as the negotiated rate with that position, and then how that would break down depending on where you're at within your plan. So if you are, again, haven't met your deductible and you're paying the full cost, the insurance would be paying zero and then you would be paying that cost. If you've met the deductible and you're paying co-insurance, this would update to reflect what the insurance 
would actually be paying on your behalf, and then also what your expected out-of-pocket costs would be, ultimately landing at zero if you've met your out-of-pocket max. One other um, tool that we have built into the experience that really helps with cost estimates is specific to our services and procedures. So if there's something that you know that you need to be completed, whether it's an MRI or something more extensive like a, um, a knee replacement surgery, which is the example we have built here, members can search again via the tech search or through the medical directory and select cost estimate. And ultimately they were um, brought to a um, tool here where they can actually select a physician to complete the um, surgery or procedure or service or a site of care if it's some sort of imaging. Um, and then ultimately they will get a full cost estimate. You know, one thing that I just wanted to call out kind of in this vein of helping guide our members and provide transparency, we do have tool tips in place here um, like this, consider an ambulatory surgery center, which is just that little gentle reminder for our members who maybe aren't as familiar that they can actually go to different sites of care and they should look for certain types of sites of care in order to get a lower cost option, but still receive that same quality um, um, service that they're looking for. But then ultimately when you select that physician or that service, you would be brought um, to a complete estimate. And if it's a multi-step process, we break that down at each step, um, who the provider or facility is that's when selected, and then you can actually change in order to see the comparison here. But then that breakdown of cost, so what the estimated total cost would be and then what you would be expected to pay. And obviously in this instance, it's an expensive knee replacement. And so once you've actually met the deductible based off of the calculation, it would then reflect to update as zero for the rest of the um, parts of the, um, the procedure or service. And then we ultimately break that all down here. The other thing that we do to help make our members um, understand their coverage and benefits is if it's something that's potentially not covered by um, their insurance, so like a, a bariatric surgery, for example, a weight loss surgery, it would actually still break down all of this cost information here, but then it would actually reflect as not covered by the health plan. So giving them that a little bit of additional information to make sure that they fully understand what they can expect to pay and what the, the expected coverage would be. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Christina Johnson to cover a little bit more details about the specifics of the No Surprises and CAA Act. Christina, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sonia, thanks, Amy. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you about the Consolidated Appropriations Act. For the next few minutes, we will cover some key provisions that you're gonna to wanna to understand. Some of the provisions under CAA are complex. They introduce new functionality and they're dependent on additional guidance to be issued by the tri agencies. As Phil mentioned, um, the, the regulation has some ambiguity around it. Some of the other provisions are more straightforward as they build on existing functionality that's currently required by healthcare reform. The additional guidance that I mentioned is going to come in three stages. The first we expect on July 1st, just right around the corner, and that's going to focus on the surprise medical billing provision. On October 1st, we're expecting additional guidance on the audit process for the qualifying payment amount, again, in surprise medical billing. Finally, on December 27th, guidance is expected around independent dispute resolution. CAA is broken into two categories. First is No Surprise Act, and the second is transparency. The transparency requirements are not to be confused with the transparency and coverage work that Sonia just spoke about. It's a little bit confusing there. First, we're going to start by looking at the No Surprise Act and some of its components. Under the No Surprise Act, there are seven actionable provisions for health plans that cover functionality around arbitration, plan ID cards, advanced cost estimator, and directory requirements, just to name a few. First, let's take a look at the surprise billing provision. This provision protects members from receiving a surprise bill for services and payment obligations beyond what their health plan covers when receiving out-of-network emergency services, services covered by out-of-network providers at in-network facilities, and for out-of-network air ambulance services. It's designed to hold consumers harmless in connection with reimbursement disagreements between the plan and out-of-network providers. Additionally, providers are prohibited from balance billing patients for out-of-network emergency services. In fact, once the member's cost share is determined based on the recognized amount, 
No matter what the final reimbursement is to the provider, the member's cost share never changes. Out-of-network providers of ancillary services and the in-network facility as well. It is important to note that patients can be balanced billed for out-of-network non-ancillary services at an in-network facility if the three following conditions occur. First is they need to inform the patient in advance that they are out of network. They need to provide an estimate of the charges and they need to secure a written acknowledgement from the patient. There are 34 states that have no surprise requirements currently in place at the state level. CA will build on the existing state requirements, not replace them. Next slide, please. As we discussed earlier, the additional guidance anticipated in July is expected to define how the qualified payment amount is calculated under CAA. This determines what the insurers and employers pay providers, as well as what the member's cost share applies to. One big change with no surprises is that the member's cost share and the provider reimbursement amounts are no longer tied to one another. They are bifurcated. The member's cost share is set based on the recommended amount. Now the provider payment is based on the go-out rate and then any negotiated and if needed independent dispute resolution. The independent dispute resolution process, sometimes called arbitration, determine the provider reimbursement amount if the health insurer or health plan and the out-of-network provider are unable to negotiate a reimbursement rate. The final dollars paid to the provider will not have any member cost share applied to them. These will be the um, at your expense. Once both providers make their final offer, the IDR and entity will choose the winning offer called baseball arbitration. That's because there is a winner and the, a loser in this process. The party whose offer was not selected pay the costs associated with the IDR process. In making their decision, the IDR and entity should consider the median contracted rate for the item of service. In addition, the IDR and entity may request the additional information allowed under CAA in order to reach a decision. Once the IDR selects the winning offer, the losing party has 30 days to pay the amount that was decided. Unless another arrangement was made, the losing party pays the IDR expenses of the other party as well. Next slide, please. For ID, for ID card requirements, the following enhancements must be made to the plan ID cards beginning on or after January 1, 2022, as plans renew. The card is to include the in-network and out-of-network deductible, the out-of-pocket maximum limitations applicable to the plan coverage, and telephone numbers and the website address where the members may obtain support. Now keep in mind as you're designing your new card layout for the CA requirements that the state plan ID requirements will need to be adhered to as well. For example, one of the things that's caused us challenges, there's four states that have font size requirements at the state level that you need to make sure that you um, take into consideration. This is an example of where a seeming simple requirement to add these fields becomes more complex because just of real estate and the state requirements that need to be honored as well. ID cards must be print ready by the plan renewal date. Members may view and print their cards after these dates and new cards may go out on or after January 1, 2022, based on your normal production schedules. As you can see in the top right hand of the uh, screen here, once the information is applied for each person, the tiering, the pharmacy, the ID card is gonna get really crowded. Um, for those of you that are UHC customers, we are working with your customized uh, plan ID cards that are in place already when we design the layout um, to make sure that they conform with the CAA requirements. Now we're going to talk about the advanced cost estimate requirements. All healthcare providers and facilities are required to ask patients when they schedule a visit if they have group coverage. If the patient has coverage, the provider or facility must provide a notice to the health plan with the services that are reasonably expected to be provided in connection with the visit. Using the information in that notice, the insurer or plan must provide the member with a notification of cost estimates based on the member's plan through mail or electronic means within the specified time outlined by CAA. Next slide, please. 
What you should know about the choice of healthcare provider requirements is that if a plan requires a PCP designation, members need to be able to select their own PCP, as long as the PCP is in network and accepting patients. This includes selecting a pediatrician as a PCP for a dependent child or providing direct access to OBGYN. The functionality required by the continuity of care provision might be in place for you already under your transition of care arrangement. Under no surprises, the member may request to continue care under the same term if their provider is no longer in network or their contract is terminated. This is only applicable in specific care situations. Finally, no surprises requires that provider directories be available online. The provider must verify their information within the timeframe specified or the provider will be suppressed from showing on the directory page. Directories must be updated by the times noted in the guidance. Finally, if a member calls us to verify a specific provider is in network, a confirmation must be sent to the member and it needs to be kept on file for two years. Do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? Now that we've wrapped up discussions on the No Surprises Act, let's our turn our attention to the Transparency Act. Again, just as a reminder, this uh, transparency requirements are separate from the transparency coverage of federal regulation. The Transparency Act has four actionable provisions and they focus primarily on reporting. The first we're gonna talk about is the gag rule provision. It specifies that group health plan contracts or agreements may not prohibit the issuer or health plan from providing specific cost or quality of care information uh, to, through consumer engagement tools or other methods. Additionally, the insurer or health plan needs to submit an attestation concern, confirming compliance annually. Under the broker and service provider provision, any direct or indirect compensation, compensation must be disclosed to the plan sponsor or enrollee. The disclosure in the group market is the responsibility of the brokers prior to contract execution, while the disclosure in the individual market is the responsibility of the health plan at the time of quote and enrollment. Finally, in the individual market, there is an annual report requirement to the HH, HHS secretary prior to the beginning of open enrollment. Pharmacy cost reporting provision requires that health plans offering group or individual health insurance coverage must report plan specific prescription drug spending and certain medical costs data annually to the tri agency. Reports are to be submitted beginning December 27th, 2021, and we report on the prior year's dates. For example, the 2021 report will contain information on the plan year 2020. And then the report is submitted annually after that, and, but it can't be re reported later than June. I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention. And Phil, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Christina. Really appreciate you going through that material. And um, I, I will tell you that uh, there is a lot of detail and complexity in there. And it was mentioned earlier, but I do want to emphasize that we will be um, submitting the content so you can have that there in front of you. And also want to emphasize certainly that your um, United Healthcare teams and of course Health Action Council are there to kind of support you in, in kind of navigating through the complexity of the information. So um, I guess before we head into q and I'll just emphasize our commitment as a company. Um, we have been long supporters of um, what I'll call actionable price and, and quality transparency for both consumers and businesses. So, you know, we're not um, fighting against these regulations. I would say we're trying to make them administri administratively um, easy. We, we don't think it should be a huge cost or regulatory burden on top of everything. There's some important aspects that come out of it. So we're working with federal and in some cases local authorities to, to try to do that. But we're, we're big fans of transparency and, and we think that on balance, obviously there being some near-term challenges, but over the longer term, we think it's going to drive some really positive behavior in the system. I think at this point, um, we'll take some um, questions to the extent that uh, that you have them and happy to go um, whatever direction you'd like. So um, I think I'll, I'll pause there. I'm not sure who's going to kind of facilitate the questions, but um, I, myself and Sonia and Christina, happy to answer anything that you might have.
Kevin, do you want to jump on that and facilitate the question? Yeah, yeah this is you're yeah, happy to do that. Um, and thanks everybody. I think it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think the first question was, is, are the slides going to be shared? And absolutely, we'll take care of that. Um, one question that did come up is, can you describe how the new CAA regulations will impact air ambulance charges? These can be pretty expensive for um, ASO plans. Can we expect savings or is this going to be a case where it, you know, it might it balloon for plan sponsors? Sure. Um, an interesting dynamic um, we've seen in the last four or five months is that a number of the uh, air ambulance providers who tend not to be in network for, for the most part, there are some exceptions, but they tend to prefer to operate out of network, um, charge as much as they possibly can, and then see what gets paid um, because of some of the state regulations allow that. Um, they've been increasing their charges pretty substantially over the last six months. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that specifically in regards to CAA, um, but I, but I, it could be um, in terms of them kind of preparing to rebaseline heading into um, a new world. In terms of will it help um, the CAA provisions, I, I do think that it will have an impact over time time of bringing more rational charges in that space for air ambulance. Um, the way in which the arbitration works is that you can only bring an arbitration suit, I believe, once per month. Christina can jump in here. And, and when the arbitrator makes the decision, they have to look at what the insurance company is offering and what the, um, what the provider is willing to pay. But they do have to consider what the average benchmark is in the market. So now, interestingly, everyone raising their rates in air ambulance, right, like raises the benchmark up. So there's an interesting, there's an interesting dynamic there. But I, I do think overall, with the new provisions, it will give somewhat more leverage in the air ambulance space. But Christina, I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. No, I think Phil that that I agree with everything you said, and and um, I don't think I have anything to add. Thanks. Perfect. Um, another question that came in today was, uh, for the IDR process, will the member or the employer be responsible for participating in the IDR process? The plan will be responsible part to participate. So it will be the provider that initiates and the plan um, that will be participating. Terrific. Um, another question that came in is, so how should a plan sponsor factor in the new state regulations if they are not domiciled in the state where the state laws are starting to encroach on ERISA plans, yet they have employees in that state? I'm going to give you my my view on this is that for the for the most part, for most of the regulations, um, what I'll say is that the national regulations would apply. So you you look at the national benchmark where that would apply, that would be the dominant, um, the dominant, um, the um, in terms of how it works. The, the one place that I think I don't have the answer to yet and remains to be seen is how the um, what I'll call the national out of network. Um, um, bill will intersect with local regulations and a provider saying, hey, wait a second, I'm going through one process here for a self-funded group and I have a, I have an entirely different process here for a fully insured group situs in Ohio versus a self-funded group. So I, I think that there is some complexity in terms of how those two things work out, but I would say just generally speaking, um, it will be the it'll be those regulations that apply nationally that will apply to the ERISA groups. Terrific. Uh, this is going to be an interesting question. So, uh, do you anticipate the contracted pricing transparencies leading to consolidation amongst the insurer industry? So, hmm. thinking about will Aetna, Blue Cross, Cigna, United Healthcare, do you anticipate any potential mergers as a result of that? I would be, uh, I would be, Kevin, extremely surprised. Um, if this drives any further m a activity, I would say that e if you even just put aside um, the transparency and everything there, I, I think that there's been signaling both at the local and the national level that any further health insurance co consolidation is going to be frowned upon. Um, I'm actually going to go the other direction on this. I, I actually think the transparency, um, it is possible that it could create additional competition in the space. 
um, you know, reference-based players now that you, you, you know, it used to be, or it will be that, you know, historically having those network contracts and those relationships was a key differentiator. Having the visibility of all rates will make it easier for new players to either build networks or work with reference-based arrangements. So I actually think that it could lead to more competition in the space rather than less. I don't really see it leading to additional consolidation. And so that kind of brings on the follow-up question to that is, is how important is it then if it's, if it's your pricing has historically been, you know, on a market by market basis, some of the leading indicators that you know, plan sponsors have used, you know, what are the things that they should be evaluating looking forward as you look at this you know, consolidation of prices, uh, number one, at, at, at the provider level um, in, in these major markets where there's competition, but also, and I'll have I'll have you answer that one first, and then I've got a follow up, which will be on more on telemedicine on that. That's a great question. It's a great question, Kevin. So here's what I'd say: is historically, there's been a lot of focus on who's got the best discounts, and 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 you know what, discounts are important, but we really see that in the future, kind of really narrowing. Not that it won't exist, but we think it's going to narrow a lot with that transparency, and so. I want to go back to what I said earlier, which which what you're looking for from your insurer, which becomes very important, is how they how are they handling total cost of care, meaning how good is their clinical framework, how good is their engagement, their advocacy, their ability to work with the providers, um, in particular on pharmaceutical. I mean, I think high cost drugs are a huge driver of future cost. And so an example I use frequently when I'm out um, talking to groups is that we can create a formulary, we, we can do a lot of different um, copay and co-insurance programs on the drugs, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the best way um, to work the member through the system is to make sure they try the generic, they try the tier one and the tier two before they get to the drug that's a million dollars a year. And that requires partnership with the physicians. And so really working through that process and, and that partnership is critical. So I, I, I think, um, you know, yeah, des discounts are important. They will remain important, but increasingly it's how can your carrier deliver total cost of care across all those programs? Perfect. So, I, you know, obviously underneath the CARES Act, we had the ability for telemedicine to be kind of you know, distributed and managed across state lines, which is fairly unique. Uh, there's been some recent introduction of legislation to allow that to continue. Do you see in these, as you described earlier, a high cost market uh, where you've got one dominant player who might see an increase in that? Do you see telemedicine having a potential impact on that uh, in a, either a, a dominant market or a rural market that's not very well serviced by the local hospital system? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the um, I think there are very, very significant changes coming on in, in what I'll call the telehealth market. Um, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about something that we're in development right now, which is this idea of for, uh, um, and I'm not even necessarily say it's, it's not necessarily a younger consumer or a generation of consumer, but there are certain consumers who are very comfortable just, you know, picking up their phone and saying, hey, I'm going to click a button and I'm going to go to the nearest provider. And I think what we're trying to extend that and say, well, it's not just I'm going to click a button and I'm going to get a random person on the other end of the phone, but I'm going to get a care team. And that care team is going to pick up within a minute. It's very fast. And that care team is going to coach me through do you know what? Um, it's not necessarily an MD who picks up the phone, but it's your care team and you know them and they've got all your data in front of you and say, hey, you know what? What's the problem today, Phil? Do you need a behavioral health? Do you need uh, do you just need a lab? Um, do you need a do you need a strep test? I can help you with that. I'm going to help you navigate um, and I'll help you navigate to the most efficient local provider. Um, so, you know what, there might only be, it, it, this isn't much of the rural, but think about an urban, they're going to say, okay, Phil, you know what, I, I looked where you're at right now, there's three places, I've matched that against which are the highest quality, most cost effective places, and I'm going to send you right there. Um, and so that combination of telehealth with local care delivery, I think is really important. And if, if I leave you with one thing on the telehealth, I think that we've seen a really powerful push that people love to be able to see a physician virtually they want to see their own physician that that's really the magic like they it, it, there there's always a time and a place where it's 10 o'clock on saturday night my, my child's crying just give me the nearest person right but but for the most part it's it's more of a convenience play of seeing your own person who you have a relationship with so that's how i see the telehealth playing out and and just to close out tremendously impactful in rural um, when you think about actually i'll just go a little bit direction on this on behavioral which is even as we sit here today 
over half of our behavioral visits, outpatient visits are still virtual. And, mm-hmm. and so the ability, you know, behavioral is a really great one where a lot of these rural communities just don't have access to behavioral resources. And now, you know what, I can do it virtually. It's a huge expansion and a huge win for, for those communities. Well, I want to thank you and I want to thank the entire United Healthcare team for uh, sharing the information today. I think there's a lot of a lot of transparency from all of you about where you're at, where you're going, but also where the industry as a whole is going, meaning it's it's a lot harder than everyone thinks it is. And so the frustration that plant sponsors are having, uh, it's also shared a little bit what I heard today from both from the United Healthcare team is it's it's not as clear as what we want it to be, uh, but we're all working in the right direction and pulling you know in the same directions to to create better outcomes for everybody. And I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Health Action Council uh, and all of the folks that are on the call today for your time. Uh, we've got some questions, like I said, Um, We'll make sure that we get the slides out to everybody for those of you who are inquiring about that. Um, And I appreciate everyone's time. We'll look forward to, uh, for those of you who are attending, your your Health Action Council team will be following up with you to broadly introduce you to who we are and what we do. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.